Good evening. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to our first Fulbright Forum presented by 2011 Program Year Grantee. Tonight we are joined by junior researcher Jacob Reedhead as he presents Control Legitimacy and Change Economic Transition in Socialist China, Vietnam, and North Korea. In his presentation, Jacob will compar comparatively examine the major socialist economies of East Asia using a framework based on historical experience. Specifically, he hopes to learn more about how China and Vietnam have been able to successfully implement economic reforms while North Korea has not. This comparative study can ideally propose solutions to the modern economic crisis plaguing North Korea. With the new government of Kim Jong-un still in its transitional phase, the present time is full of opportunity for the new regime to take North Korea's economy to the next level of development, looking to China and Vietnam as a model. Jacob received his master's degree in statistics from the Ohio State University and is currently working to complete a PhD in sociology at the University of Washington. He has spent extensive time in North Korea, primarily as U.S. NGO uh, food monitor during to the 2008 to 2009 USAID food program. Following tonight's presentation and a brief Q&A, I hope that you will join us for a very light reception on the third floor. And now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming 2011 Fulbright Junior Researcher, Jacob Reedhead. Good evening. Uh, I know a lot of you, and a lot of you I don't know. But, uh, thanks for coming out. The weather's getting a little warmer. I'm sure that has something to do with our numbers tonight. Um, historically, I've not been good with time management when giving speeches. So tonight, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to kind of go through my framework uh, pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to skim over a lot of the, the details and the evidence and uh, I'm just going to give you a, a kind of a sense of the, of the framework and then I'd like to spend more time on Q&A and if we have specific questions at that time we can go back and look at look at different parts that you might be interested in or address questions that, that I didn't in this talk. So when we think about North Korea though uh, these are some of the images that come to mind, starvation or, uh, or uh, the nuclear program. The, the North Korea that I want to talk about tonight is not on those extremes. I want to talk more in the mode of the experiences of typical uh, you know, North Koreans living out in the provinces or Pyongyang. These are definitely aspects of North Korea, but sometimes in understanding what kind of place North Korea is, we we tend to focus on the polar, you know, the, the extremes, and which is very important, and there, you know, a lot of good work is done in that area. But, uh, but I'm I'm interested in the questions about um, the North Korean economy in general, and the uh, and the and the life that, that ordinary people are living there on the ground, which is 
uh, which looks a little bit more like this. Uh, this was some. I didn't take this picture, but this is uh, very representative of what I saw in the in the countryside outside of Pyongyang. Whenever we talk about North Korea, it's important to make the distinction between Pyongyang and everywhere else. Uh, but this is really common. Uh, ox carts and uh, the, the kind of housing settlements back in here. This is really typical. And usually in this area, you would have some kind of a, this might be kind of collective farm area. And then you can see these little, little embankments here. These are going to be private or kind of family farms, you know, each in these enclosed in the walls. And then you see areas of pretty severe deforestation in you know, certain, certain areas. And um, uh, unpaved roads outside of Pyongyang and outside of uh, South Pyongyang province, it's, it's almost all unpaved roads. In some, some towns, you'll get, you know, concrete. Uh, paved again, but in, in most of the rural areas, you've got these unpaved areas. Um, so, and it's I think it's typical when we see images in, of, like this um, to ask why North Korea is doing this. Why why is this where we're directing the resources? You know, and. When people are living like this, and this is this is also a really common picture. I didn't again. I didn't take this picture, but it's a very common, a typical picture out in the provinces of, of uh, people just selling, um, you know, cigarettes or candy or basic, you know, simple food items. But why, when people are living like like this, why they react like this? And so, I mean, two of the two of the questions are. What is the North Korean government thinking, and why doesn't it just reform? Um, why is the party committed to this particular course? And is it out of ideological commitment or just a desire to preserve the regime? Kind of what's what's the logic? And is the regime interested at all in economic prosperity or the well-being of the people? These are some questions that come to mind about the regime, kind of on the you know, top down, looking at society from top down, but from the bottom up too. These are images of um, uh, during the uh, kind of moment of silence, you know, in respect for, for Kim Jong Il after Kim Jong Il passed. There were you know, a lot of these images floating around. But on this end of the spectrum, what are the North Korean people thinking? What do they think about their lives, about the regime? Why don't they just? protest or rebel? Um, do they support the regime? Like Brian Myers argues, uh, maybe some of you have read that book, uh, out of some radical sense of ethnic nationalism, or are they simply being ruled under fear and control with labor camps and public executions? and, and um, Or are they simply ignorant of how bad things are inside of the country and how good things are outside of the country? Um, but these questions underlie, belie some strong assumptions. And my research begins by critically exploring these questions themselves and the assumptions that underlie them. So why do we expect North Korea's government to reform? And why would we expect the, the people to rebel or to, to protest or to expect anything different from their government? Why, why do we ask those questions? This is why we ask those questions. This is Shanghai, that's Ho Chi Minh City. And these are adjacent, uh, or I mean, you know, China is adjacent to North Korea, and Vietnam, China, and North Korea were all uh, communist, you know, socialist economies at one point. Uh, and now they look like this, and North Korea looks like the, the man with the ox cart. And we also ask because of because of this because this happened. This is the statue of Lenin uh, being displaced after the the fall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and things like this. This is the Berlin Wall in 1989. 
and more recently because of this, in Tokyo Square, in Cairo. And so we have a lot of examples of either totalitarian regimes or even, you know, if you just want to narrow the scope to uh, the socialist regimes where either the government's reformed or the people rebelled, but one of the two happened. And North Korea somehow seems to be stuck in between just muddling along, neither collapsing nor reforming. So how is that possible? I think that's that question. I mean, North Korea kind of being in the middle there confounds us. You know, we don't understand why it's, how it can persist in the way that it's persisting. And so our questions are derived from these comparisons. They're derived from the comparisons that we make about Socialist Asia or about Eastern Europe. And it's not that this is North Korea here, this is South Korea, there's Seoul, a city that never sleeps. Here's Japan. Here's the eastern <coughs> seaboard of China and Manchuria. It's not that that region is so dark. There are a lot of other regions on the map that are also dark, like Mongolia and up here by Vladivostok. And nobody's asking why, you know, Mongolia doesn't reform or why people Vladivostok don't rebel. Right? It's not the absolute difference. It's the comparison. You know, it's it's the fact that North Korea here is this black hole on the map is kind of squashed between between that and that and that. And so, because these comparisons are so intrinsic to the way that we think about North Korea, to understand, in order to understand North Korea and the countries that we're comparing it with, we need a comparative framework. And so tonight, um, I'll present a comparative framework that allows us to kind of reframe these questions and then come back and maybe answer some of them. Oh, these are these are probably too dark for you to see. I apologize. This says Eastern Europe, and this is Socialist Asia. Okay, so, so my framework is. Uh, I'll present my framework in three acts. Um, so the first act, I'll give some points about compar comparing Eastern Europe to Socialist Asia, and kind of the the main theme of this act is political legitimacy, and that's going to be a major piece of this puzzle. And then in Act 2, we'll talk about, within Socialist Asia, we're going to contrast China, Vietnam, to North Korea, and see what's going on there, what are the differences there. And the, the main uh, the takeaway from this is going to be a combination of security uh, and factionalism. And I'll explain more what I mean by that. And then in Act 3, we're going to talk about North Korea and some of current uh, changes that are going on in North Korea and, and, and kind of think about what these changes say about the model that I'm presenting. Is, is the model itself changing? So, so to begin with Act 1, uh, you want to look at how China, North Korea, and Vietnam are similar over here and how they differ from East Germany, Russia, Hungary, Romania, these Eastern European uh, Soviet spirit. This is going to be, um, I spent a lot more time focusing on the, the contrast within Socialist Asia. So these contrasts are pretty, very general. And uh, any of you who have experience with a particular country in Eastern Europe might find that these contrasts don't necessarily hold as tightly. Um, with, this, with this argument, I'm just trying to, to make, I'm trying to make the argument that, that Socialist Asia uh, that the communist parties in China, North Korea, and Vietnam were founded on a very different uh, base of political legitimacy. That their political legitimacy lies in very different historical experiences than those of Eastern Europe. So that's the main kind of takeaway point. You might be able to argue, you know, the uh, nuts and or it's kind of the ticky tacky points of my comparisons, but so. But somebody who has studied Eastern Europe a lot, uh, Dan Shiro, one of my advisors, says that in, uh, in Eastern Europe, in the, in the, following the uh, industrialization, industrial revolution, and the um, kind of the age of empires, 
that a lot of the countries in Eastern Europe felt that they had a, an ethnicity problem. And there were a lot of ethnic minorities. And, and the governments in Eastern Europe, well, history kind of looks back on these governments as being victims of Nazi Germany. A lot of um, countries, Romania, the Czech Republic, uh, a lot of these places collaborated, actually collaborated with the Nazis during that time to facilitate ethnic cleansing and replacement, resettlement of, of ethnic minorities. And so at the time, a lot of these uh, uh, countries viewed the Nazis as kind of a solution to their minority problems. And, and it wasn't just the Jews or, you know, that were persecuted during these groups, but a lot of countries used the opportunity or used the, the Nazi kind of the rise of of nationalism uh, in Europe to kind of resolve some of the, I mean, in very um, distasteful ways, resolve some of the their internal kind of ethnic problems. And once that happened, and once the kind of the Nazi thing had kind of run its course uh, and it kind of gotten too powerful for its own good, then the communists, uh, you know, then Russia ruled through by the Soviet Union and the, and the communists kind of sphere was, uh, was a way to kind of absolve their, to wash their hands of that because, you know, that was the Nazis, we didn't do that, that was the Nazis' fault, and now, um, you know, now we've got the, the Nazis were the bad guys, and now we've got the, the Soviet Union to kind of kick out the bad guys, and, you know, we were the victims in that, in that situation. So, so a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, you know, kind of historical trauma there in the, in the occupation of uh, of Eastern Europe by by common by Soviet Union and by kind of communist regimes kind of was a way to kind of erase the memory and also uh, and so these a lot of these, most of these countries became Russian satellites in Socialist Asia I think a lot of we might be more familiar with the history here there was uh, all three countries China Vietnam and uh, and the Korean Peninsula experienced um, Western colonization in some form, some degree. They all experienced Japanese occupation by the, by the Japanese Empire. Um, they all experienced civil wars as a result of the power of the power vacuum that, that came from these series of onslaughts. And and then uh, and then the civil war, the divisions in these three three countries were exacerbated uh, and kind of polarized the long Cold War divisions. Um, in China and Vietnam, the civil wars happened before the Cold War, and then the, the Cold War kind of dichotomy was overlaid on top of that division. In, in the Korean Peninsula, it was the opposite, that we had the Cold War, that, that the onset of the Cold War was what divided the peninsula, and then the civil war came afterwards. But either way, these divided countries, North and South Vietnam, mainland China and Taiwan, and then North and South Korea, um, we're all, all experienced some similar, some kind of permutation of these historical experiences. So what's the upshot of this? <clears throat> For political legitimacy, the, the communist movements in Eastern Europe came in on a mandate to replace the Nazis, we're going to wipe out the Nazis, and, and to reconstruct war-torn Europe. So this was the, the general kind of um, political mandate, this was what the communist parties in Russia and Eastern Europe based their legitimacy on, was the reconstruction of, of war-torn Europe. And, and this is kind of an economic foundation. We're going to rebuild the country, we're going to restore your, you know, we're going to improve your standard of living. Um, and of course, when this gets exacerbated during the Cold War, now it's polarized, right? We're, we're not just going to restore your standard of living, we're going to do a better job of that than the guys in Western Europe, right? Than the, than the capitalists and the, the national, the, the, you know, those guys. So, so it's still an adversarial, you know, kind of east-west thing, and that's, and that's seen especially in Germany where you, you actually have a divided country, but, but throughout Europe, you know, there are these kind of comparisons going on. But the, and, and the other, I wasn't going to get into the details, let's move on. <laughs> if I get into the details, we'll be here for all night. Okay. Uh, but in Socialist Asia, you have a very different experience. The mandate 
think about think about the societies that these communist parties are trying to raise support in. Right? This, these are these are societies, ethnic groups, China, Korea, very proud civilizations who have been humiliated by Western invaders, uh, subjugated by the Japanese, who they had perceived as inferior, uh, and. I think those two experiences, you know, the, the mandate of the Communist Party of Mao and Ho Chi Minh was to, and, and Kim, Kim Il-sung, the, the anti-Japanese guerrilla, right, was to rid the country of these foreign invaders, to restore ethnic sovereignty, uh, and to, to ensure that, you know, these countries would never be subject to these kind of attacks or these kind of humiliation again, right? And then because these, these countries all experienced civil war during this process, the second mandate was to reunify the country under the socialist banner. Uh, so this is, this is kind of, the, this is the foundation of political legitimacy initially in these three countries, China, Vietnam, uh, and, and North Korea. So that's the first Kind of contrast we want to make. <clears throat> Moving on to Socialist Asia, there's some differences, however, within within Socialist Asia. The differences between China and Vietnam, which ended up taking a, re a, a path of reform, and North Korea, which didn't, which has, hasn't. <clears throat> so in China and Vietnam, <clears throat> Interestingly enough, China and Vietnam experienced a lot of this, I mean, the same kinds of economic stagnation that North Korea did. Um, those countries weren't outliers at the time, so nobody asked why is China and Vietnam so weird. That was just part for the course in centralized planning regimes, right? But both countries experienced famines. The, the Chinese, the great Chinese famine, 58 to 62, killed countless millions, and the and uh, Vietnam also experienced a famine in 1980-81 after, after reunifying and trying to implement centralized planning and, um, and uh, uh, collectivized farming throughout South Vietnam. So both of these countries experienced the same types of economic stagnation and famines and all that, but what allowed them to change at the point that they did change? And I think there are two, the two critical factors that I've identified. Um, the first is that um, at some point, both China and Vietnam achieved military hegemony over their Cold War counterpart. So in Vietnam, this happens through the Vietnam War. Uh, North, Korea, North Vietnam defeats the United States and the South Vietnamese and, and absolves and absorbs South Vietnam, right? So now, categorically, there's no more, there is no more I mean, they, they, they unified the country under the, the socialist banner, so there is no more threat there. Uh, for China, this happened in the mid-70s. So I think the most um, clear evidence of this is the replacement of Taiwan with China on the UN Security Council, and that happened in 74, I think. It was before Mao's death, but I think that kind of, that signals to me that not just within the communist sphere, but globally, uh, that, that the United States and Western Europe and, and, and everybody else recognized that China had hegemonic, had a hegemonic advantage over Taiwan. And I think that's a really critical point that sometimes we miss when we think about why China was able to reform. <clears throat> and China has gone on to also um, uh, to become to to have greater hegemony over Taiwan in a number of other ways, not just militarily, but, but also economically and in terms of population and all these. I mean, it's, it's inconceivable now that Taiwan would ever be a, a legitimate, or be, be a threat to the legitimacy of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay. In North Korea, you have the exact opposite. You, you end the Korean War with military stalemate. There is no resolution. There is no clear winner. Um, as time goes on, North Korea's military power seems to be 
weakening relative to the south end. I mean, economically, I think the statistics now, like the GDP is like 14 to 1, south Korean economy, the north Korean economy. So there is, uh, in terms of, on the, on the, on the terrain of, of whether it's militarily, economic, or diplomatic, but however you slice it, North Korea has got no strategic advantage over the south. Right? So if, going back to that, this model of legitimacy, right? This anti-colonialism and the unification uh, platform. You know, North Korea is still very vulnerable when it comes to um, uh, portraying itself as an unchallenged, you know, hegemon of the peninsula. And the second factor is this political factionalism. So in China and Vietnam. I think the fact that the, the wars, the civil wars, happened before the Cold War, uh, and that these wars were long and protracted <coughs> wars, uh, meant that, that Mao and Ho Chi Minh alike had to, had to engage in coalition building for decades. But the, the communist parties in, in China and Vietnam were established in the 20s or 30s, and they went on through the 40s, through the 50s, and, the, and in order to defeat and in Vietnam, it went on the 60s and the 70s until the end of the Vietnam War. So, so the communist parties are are much more pluralist organizations, entities in China and Vietnam. And I think that that, that factor is what allowed these these uh, the parties to become bureaucratized to the point that they are today. And I think one of the key indicators that I look at for um, for bureaucratization is. How often and how frequent do they have? Uh, I don't want to call them elections, but I mean, party, you know, meetings of the of the um, it's not the, it's not the parliament. What do you call it? The, the oh gosh, I'm looking at all your faces in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the 15, 1,500 representatives from the other two. Thank you. Thank you. So. <laughs> So in China and Vietnam, following the opening and reform in China and following Doi Moi in Vietnam, these these plenum have been uh, periodic. I mean, they've been uh, in China every what five years, in Vietnam every four or five years. So you have a you have a kind of a renewing of the leadership. You have an opportunity. You have a um, it's not subject to the whim of the. Uh, of the current leader, that they just they have these regularly, regardless, and then they and they'll choose kind of a new uh, leadership. So I think the, sometimes the West, I think, uh, criticizes the communist parties of China and Vietnam too much for, for as single party systems. Uh, it's true that they are a single party system, but within that party, there are several factions competing for power, and you can see from plenum to plenum, as the factions shift back and forth, that there is an internal debate. I mean, now we're talking of centralized democracy. We're not talking, you know, Western-style kind of popular democracy. But at least within, within the elite, um, at the elite level, there is internal debate, and 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 the factions kind of go back and forth in terms of who who has more centralized or kind of hegemonic influence from time to time. And you see that. So that's one thing that I want to point to is this bureaucratization in China and Vietnam. North Korea, Kim takes it all. What do I mean by that? In 19, the Korean War, and, uh, let's see, no, World War II ends, uh, uh, the peninsula is divided, um, Russia comes in, and a coalition government is created in the north with four major groups, the Chinese, Koreans, the the, the Sakhalin, the Russian contingency, the domestic communist faction that had been in North Korea the whole time, and then Kim, Kim Il Sung's guerrilla group, and, and so you had a coalition government of four four parties. <clears throat> Through the next 15 years, from 1945 until 1960, and I guess really up to 1962. Uh, Kim Il-sung systematically targets each of these members of the coalition, and by 1962 has completely 
uh, remove these coalitions from power. Um, a lot of that happened during the Korean War. So, I mean, it's been argued that, that Kim Il-sung kind of extended the Korean War, pushed, you know, the Korean War as a way to kind of consolidate his power domestically. I don't think we have very good evidence of that, but, but that's the period when it happened, most of it. Uh, the, 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 Russian, the Chinese contingency was, was pretty much all, all killed. The, the Russian contingency was sent back to Russia, and the domestic contingency was also killed. So, and you don't really see, and I think other evidence of this is that you don't really see the development of Juche philosophy, the Juche Sasan, the Juche ideology, or the Kim Il sung personality cult until after 1962. Right. And after 1962, and, and I think the, the, final, the final acts that, I mean, the kind of, the final fall of the acts was the Sino-Soviet split in 1961-62, and that's what really allowed Kim Il-sung to cut ties with both China and Russia, or to kind of, we agree with the young daddy, right, but, but really he, he didn't have to cater to either one of them, and I think that's, the Sino-Soviet split was what ultimately gave Kim Il-sung absolute, absolute control over the party, uh, and which is, which is the, the, the exact opposite of what was, what happened in, you know, China and Vietnam with this coalition building. <clears throat> and now we have a system, not bureaucratization, I mean, don't get me wrong, Korea, North Korea has a very evolved bureaucracy, it does, but uh, at least, at least at the, in the years of the 60s, 70s, you know, as long as Kim Il Sung was alive, and you have this system of charismatic succession, and you know the country is being ruled by the eternal president. So, security and factionalism within this framework of legitimate, legitimacy based on anti-colonial <laughs> rule and unification in China and Vietnam. This uh, the feeling of security vis-à-vis -vis Taiwan. Right. The, the elimination of a possible contender for legitimate rule uh, is what allowed, and, and, and then also this coalition building, the bureaucratization, and, and of course the death of Mao uh, in 76, is what allowed um, Deng Xiaoping to, to kind of push a reform agenda. Right. In Korea, <coughs> We still is still contended, right? And I think I think you may not be able to visit North Korea and countryside in your life. That may not happen. Uh, but I think the evidence for this there's plenty of evidence for this even here in the South. You know, uh, one of, one of the major issues in South Korea right now. I mean, it's, it's been an ongoing issue, but is of the security laws and the. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to get in trouble if I keep going down. I have some pretty strong opinions about about this, but but I just will say that uh, you know you don't have to search too many sites about North Korea to get this blue screen that pops up that says you know warning uh, looks very federal and you know very intimidating and you kind of reverse out of your browser really quickly. Right? But there are a lot of there there's a lot of that going on here in South Korea and there have been some indictments and arrests just in the past in the past two months, right, by, by people who've, uh, you know, always oh, just parroting North Korea. Well, you can't parody that here because, you know, why not? Because, because it's still very, even no matter how economically developed South Korea becomes, there is still an existential threat to the North, which has a legitimate claim to, to rule on the peninsula, right? And the South Korean government is not naive to that. And I think until that is resolved, you're gonna, we're going to continue to see the kind of security laws and, you know, be careful what you say and, you know, let's not, um, you know, so uh, enough about that. But just needless to say, this, this, this affects both North and South. Right? Second, uh, I already mentioned that this bureaucratization coalition building led to two parties. I think, I, I like to Call it the two-party system. It's the Communist Party, but there are actually multiple factions in the CCP, and, and members of the CCP will tell you what these factions are. It's no secret. You know, there's 
Beijing faction, there's the Western faction. There are a lot of different factions in the CCP, and in Vietnam is even more. Vietnam is more, uh, I would say, kind of federalist in the sense that the the representatives who come from the regions and provinces and in, into the to the plenary are more representing their local interests than they are um, any kind of national party identity. So Vietnam is even more pluralist, uh, even though it's a one-party, technically a one-party state. North Korea, we've got the eternal president and his son and now his grandson. So, okay. So not a lot of room for factionalism. Now that's been the current kind of status to this point. But let me move on to Act 3 and we'll kind of tweak this a little bit. So what's going on in North Korea today, recently? What, any, what, are, what are some kind of differences or uh, some things that might uh, indicate that this model is changing? Well, number one, there are a lot of market forces playing on Korea, right, in, on North Korea right now. The, um, Jeffrey C. Uh, Chosun Exchange is, is a social entrepreneur of Singapore in descent, and he's, he's, he's uh, I mean, if you, if you have a chance to go to the Chosun Exchange webpage, check it out. I mean, they're doing some amazing, amazing things in North Korea right now in terms of training, in terms of bringing capital. This is all sanctioned by the, by the northern government. Um, so you, you see all kinds of, I mean, in North Korea, I would say again, the question of does North Korea want to change or reform, yes, they do. I mean, the, the, any North Korea official I talk to is interested in economic improvement, but it has to happen, it's bounded by this, by the, within this framework, right, within the framework of this anti-colonial rule and, and I mean, the, the national, this security vis-a-vis -vis South Korea, and the fear is, I mean, of course, we want economic development, right? And the North, the North is really trying to develop um, and, and attract capital any way it can, except uh, in, short of opening the doors, right? And that means that means allowing capital to come in and interact with people at the local level. So in North Korea, the model to this point has been, we'll take any capital, we're fine with organization, as long as everything gets cleared through the center down, right? And so you'll see that the NGOs get into North Korea all the time, capital flows into North Korea all the time through a very tightly controlled right, right, system. And so as long as you can get your capital or your ideas or something through that system, yeah, the, I mean, there's all, they're interested in all kinds of development, right? But how feasible is that if you're, you know, uh, you're working for some hedge fund, or you've got, you know, you're, you've got, you'd like to invest in North Korea, but you've got to, you've got to go through three months worth of paperwork every time you want to send a container to the country, right? It's just, it's not that foreign investors are scared that North Korea is going to collapse or go to war. I mean, there's some of that out there, but the, the real, on the ground, the real issue is that the bureaucratic paperwork. I mean, the, the it's just the, the headache that you have to get through to push, to push capital into the country, I mean, and not to mention that the, like the, the infrastructure, I mean, for financial infrastructure, the legal infrastructure is just kind of so rudimentary. So, um, but there are pressures kind of trying to expand that, trying to push that, that bottleneck through. There are also pressures on the bottom up, um, you know, you saw the picture of the woman kind of selling cigarettes or candy or whatnot. There's, I mean, you know, Be under no illusion that that you know that capitalism is not alive and well on the ground in North Korea. It's just that the, the infrastructure is so rudimentary and it's all kind of under the radar that uh, you know that when you don't have basic infrastructure like banks or currency exchange or um, contracts or property rights. I mean, when you don't have these kind of things, it's really hard to, you're basically reduced to like bartering and, and uh, I mean, and there's a lot of that going on, a lot of bartering and that kind of, that kind of market activity, lo loosely organized um, market activity, but there's a lot of it going on. And people have, are, have some really creative, are developing some really creative solutions on the ground, you know, very cautiously to try to kind of get around these. A lot of, 
one of the most um, one of the things that I noticed the most when I was in North Korea was how uh, liberally government agencies would allow their assets to be used by uh, you know for economic enterprise. So in North Korea, the only kind of legitimate infrastructure is government infrastructure. So if you want to do any kind of legitimate business, you have to go through the auspices of some local or national agency. So you'll find agencies like, um, you know, like a provincial uh, commerce committee, say in, you know, in Shiniju, will loan out its vehicles, its trucks, to uh, people who want to do trade with China, and and then the local provincial, you know, officials will get the, the, the travel permits and whatever, and and they'll kind of engage in this uh, small scale local enterprise using whatever assets they have in the name of the government agency. Um, but it, you know, in reality, some entrepreneur came along and said, you know, it'd be really great if we could, you know, get this up and going. You know, who's and then they go shopping for, you know, within their social network, who can, who do I know who's could sponsor me, you know, where can I draw some assets? And so you see some really creative kind of solutions to this. Another, another piece of evidence that I want to, that, that really just kind of stuck out when I saw it was that two years ago, North Korea formally removed all references to communism in its national constitution. So North Korea, officially by their own admission, is no longer a communist country, right? So again, the point here is this is not about a commitment to communist ideology. Right, that's long gone. Uh, I don't think anybody in the government is committed even really to centralized planning for economic purposes. Right? The commitment to centralized planning and all of these other kind of constraints, these social constraints, is because of the legitimacy issues that we talked about. It's about security, it's about fear of being of South Korean products just flooding into the country, of people flooding into the country, and the government uh, no longer being able to to guarantee I mean, the government no longer being able to argue that it should be the legitimate government of the country, right? So as long as the only way that North Korea can really stay in power there is if is if uh, there's an enemy to the south and it's doing a good job of kind of fending off that enemy, right? So, okay, so pipes and systemic dissonance. This, this was talking about the political factionalism. We talked about, you know, Kim, Kim kind of grabbed it all, right, and that there wasn't any kind of room for dissent. Um, a number of books and studies that have come out in the last 10 years have really questioned this. And I think since the death of Kim Il-sung and, and uh, the succession of power by Kim Jong-il, right, I'm not talking about the current leader, but under Kim Jong-il back in 94, from that time on, there are strong indications that there you know, the, the party, the government, and the military all are representing kind of different um, interests, again, within the same legitimacy framework, but re but representing different interests, and that they each have kind of a, kind of some tug and pull, right? And so some of the conflicting messages that we get out of North Korea sometimes, like, yeah, we'd love to talk, says the, state, says the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then they bomb a ship. Right, so you get these conflicting messages. It's not clear whether this is a, whether this is being orchestrated by one mind, right, the brain of Kim Jong Il or the brain of Kim Jong Un, or whether this reflects some kind of conflicting struggle for power within the regime. And I think there's enough evidence to show that there is indeed this factionalism uh, within the regime, just like. Deng Xiaoping and uh, Liu Xiaoqi had tried to try to circumvent Mao's economic policies back in the 60s, right? But they were effectively shut down by by Mao because the the security, the, again, the legitimacy framework didn't allow for that at the time. But as soon as Mao died, you know, these factions emerge and contend with each other. You got the Gang of Four contending with Deng Xiaoping, and Deng Xiaoping wins that, you know, pretty handily and so I think these, I think the, the earlier argument about the lack of factionalism within the party 
is an old argument. I think there is sufficient factionalism, reform-oriented factionalism in the party that is willing to step up should the legitimacy framework change, right? But I think that's the big, that's the big key right now. Uh, and, then, and then we have to look at the, this idea of the legitimacy, legitimacy framework itself. Um, how long are the North Korean people going to buy uh, by that argument, right? That, that, that our government's purpose is not to promote economic prosperity, but our government's purpose is to protect us from South Korea and the, those American, you know, war warmongers. Um, as long as the North Koreans are kind of buying into that, yeah, then I wouldn't expect to see any kind of protests, right, in spite of famine and whatever, because they. They, that's not what the government promised to do. The government, the government promised to protect them from outside invaders. Right? So, uh, is there evidence suggesting that people on the ground are changing their attitudes about that? Um, not so much, surprisingly. I think that the most surprising, uh, the most shocking evidence that I saw was um, some out polls, some exit polls conducted by Marcus Nolan and uh, Stephen Haggard and some of their folks at County University collaborators there. And they interviewed a outcome um, defecting North Koreans on the on the Chinese border, right? So this we're not talking about Koreans who come through China and into South Korea. We're talking about North Koreans as they exit North Korea, you know, within a within a matter of days or weeks. Uh, a thousand were sampled, were surveyed, and there was overwhelming um, agreement that the government was ineffective uh, at implementing kind of economic policies, and they were not critical of Kim Jong Il's regime. Right? So how do you reconcile those two things? I think this framework is what explains that. Right? They're 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 not deluded at all that their that their government or that their economy is 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 in shambles. Right? They're absolutely aware of that fact. Uh, that's made more apparent to them day by day, you know, as the Korean dramas and outside news comes in. There's no, they're not under the delusion that their country is a, is a worker's paradise, right? They know things are bad. But I think more than we realize, you know, the North Korean people, by and large, still believe that their government is legitimate. Right? Not on economic grounds, but on the grounds of the framework that we talked about. So that's hard to swallow, I think, for a lot of people. Because to us, we've never known anything else, right? Our government <coughs> is only as good as, you know, I mean, when re-election time comes, if the, if the economy's been good, the president gets re-elected. If the economy's been bad, he doesn't, right? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but, but in North Korea, it's the, the, the government never claimed to, pr to never promised. Uh, that was never the basis of their, their rule. To, to promote economic prosperity. Right? If it was, it was way down on the list compared to these other things. So, so, but that's the real, that's one of the real keys to look at. If we're looking for social change, if we're, if we're looking for an Arab Spring in North Korea, when do we see indicators that North Koreans are uh, no longer happy with their government on the grounds that it claims to you know, legitimately rule it? And, and I just want to add that leaving North Korea is not necessarily an indication that they do not respect the government. As, and you could, you could uh, if you surveyed kind of maybe a handful of even North Korean defectors living in South Korea, you, you, you might be surprised that a lot of them still have respect for their, for their government in the sense that it has to this point preserved the sovereignty of North Korea and a lot of them still feel pride in that. So I think this is the, really the key point that I'm trying to communicate to you tonight is that the North Koreans do not base uh, their, they don't base their value uh, judgment of their government on its ability to produce economic prosperity. I mean, um, okay, and then of course the last thing is, is reform what we really want. So I mean we talked about kind of this model kind of pr provides some um, policy levers, you know, ideally if we, if we 
Ostensibly, if we wanted to promote a reform platform, we would try to reduce the perceived threat of out external, uh, you know, we would try to re uh, reduce the, the perception of external threat, right? Try to play down South Korea and the United States as kind of, you know, saber rattling. That's one thing we would do to make to help them feel more secure about opening up, right? That would be one thing that we would do if we want to encourage reform. The second is to try to push open that bottleneck and try to promote that more factionalism and pluralism in the government, right? And one of the policies that we could implement to do that is to try to work with a combination of different agencies within North Korea um, who we know have reform interests, you know. And, and so these are some policy... Uh, policy levers that we could pull if reform, a reform North Korea is really what our governments want, but I, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that that's really what South Korea or the United States wants. I think they'd like to see something like an Arab Spring or something else. They'd like to see, you know, a failure and a collapse rather than a muddling through and a, and a reform. So that's something that we have to ask ourselves is what, you know, this is fine, this is good and fine, but what do we, you know, what do the what do the powers that be really want? So, so these are. Uh, I think I'll leave it here. Um, these are some people I want to thank, uh, or places, institutions that have helped me out to this point with my research: the Department of Sociology and the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington, uh, the Korean Institute for National Unification. Has been I've been affiliated with them during my stay here in Korea uh, with the Korea American Education Commission and the Fulbright Commission, and. Um, if you've got any questions. Education okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. What about commission? Can you issue the same thing, same body? That's all. Despite the, the, the productivity and the, the, the prosperity that is evident in China and uh, Vietnam, the, the, the guy with the ox cart is still there. And so I, I'm wondering how, you know, how appropriate that is as a model for, for North Korea. I mean, there, uh, how, as far as Vietnam and, uh, and China have Progressed. I mean, they, they're still they're, they're still very far you know, behind other you know, developing countries or developed countries. Sure. I think there's a you know as I when I did this com the comparative work, I thought you know it'd be great to compare China and Vietnam with North Korea because China and Vietnam can say a lot about the North Korean case because they've gone places where North Korea hasn't yet. Right? But I was also hoping that North Korean cases could say something about China and Vietnam. I think it does. I think it does tell us a lot about the origins of reform, like we talked about, you know, leading up in the 70s and whatnot. But the literature in China and Vietnam, like as you as you alluded to, has moved well beyond that. that. You know, nobody's interested in what got China and Vietnam kind of opened initially, right? We're we're past that. We're in a different era now. And dealing with some of these questions, not about the origins of reform, but now the consequences of reform, and how is transition happening, and gosh, we thought that opening up would give us this, you know, kind of liberal democracy, but now we see it's kind of an illiberal democracy, and if a democracy at all, and, and this, you know, and we have all the issues that we, we still have in South Korea, too, like, uh, and the United States, with these kind of wealth gaps, and growing, you know, the East and West gap, and so I think there's a, you know, the literature and the, the, the research in this area, and of course the social consciousness, has moved on into the direction that you've alluded to, you know, fine, these, co these countries opened up, but that doesn't mean, you know, prosperity for all, it doesn't mean, so, and I think that's actually one of the things that North Koreans are nostalgic for when they come to South Korea and they can't pay their college tuition, is, you know, gosh, you know, North Korea, things were bad back there, but, you know, we were all equally bad. <laughs> or, or, you know, the government had at least, you know, the government had systems where, you know, the services weren't great, but the services were available to everybody free of charge. And, you know, so 
the Russians say the same thing. Yeah, there's a lot of nostalgia. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you just mentioned uh, that uh, in North Korea there are possibly uh, some indications of struggle of power that is not, you know, that definite as it was before. Why do you think so? Don't you think that the elites in North Korea, on the contrary, have no choice but to stay united? Otherwise, uh, you know, there is a high probability of risk, you know, related to that legitimate security concerns that you mentioned. Sure. So I think that. Uh, Could you repeat it? Okay. The question is. Uh, why would there be factionalism among the elites in North Korea? Don't they know they have to stay kind of united if they want to preserve the regime? I think um, there are elites in North Korea, and then there are elites. And in Pyongyang, you've got uh, you've got military elites, and that's kind of their social network. You've got the bureaucracy and the, the state, right? And then you also have to distinguish between the state and the Party. So they're really kind of three large, if you want to look at it at that level, just disaggregated to three kind of three large players. And then, of course, within those, there are many more actors, right? But the interests of uh, the, the, the largest struggle has seemed to have been between the military and the party. So Kim Il sung had always based his power in the party, and Kim Il sung. And when Kim Il Sung dies, or and Kim Jong Il comes to power, you see a shift towards the military. Right? And this, the the Sungun Chungchek, the military first policy was implemented. And I think what I think what was going on there was again, this is all within the boundaries of that framework. Like you said, they can't they can compete. It's a program. Right, but they can't compete too much. They can't compete to the to the total detriment of the other, otherwise the whole system will collapse. Right? That's why that's why you see this kind of political competition, but you don't see it, I don't think you're likely to see a coup d'etat, right, or a revolution led by one faction over the other. You're just gonna see some kind of bounded power struggles. Right? And so so there was a, a lot of indication that Kim Jong il, because he didn't have the same he didn't have that same power that his father did, right? He didn't. I mean, he's a he's a second generation copy of the charismatic leader, right? Charisma has a shelf life; it has a half life with each generation, right? So, <laughs> so, so he's not quite the not quite the same as his father. And I think North Koreans, when I was in North Korea, felt that a lot. A lot of respect to this day for Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Il. Yeah, he's our leader, you know. But but I think that's why you see the shift to the military because Kim Jong Il had to had to build a coalition right with the military and and, and that meant implementing the Sungun Jungchek and it's interesting with Kim Jong Un people have been watching that what is this going to mean you know the kind of his godfather his uncle Jang Sin Tech is a military man but he's married to a party he's married to his to Kim Jong Il's sister. Right? Who's a party person, right? So that that marriage there, Jiang Sing Tech and and uh, I think that's a you know a lot of people thought well you know I mean if, depending on how ambitious that sister is, it wouldn't be too hard to get rid of the the nephew, and then you'd have that power couple, you know the sister and the and Jiang Sing Tech who's a really high ranking general. You could that's kind of a marriage between the party and the general, and if she has children, right? And now we're thinking kind of dynastic. This is like. You know, Tejango, like, you know, what is <laughs> get rid of this guy, you know, so I can promote my son. And, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I think that kind of analysis is not, you, have you seen the reports about uh, the, the rumors that, you know, there, there might be assassination attempts on Kim Jong Nam, the oldest brother, or, you know, if he, I think, again, this is all, this is straight out of, like, Chosun dynasty, dynasty politics, right? I mean, Kim Jong Nam better stay out of Dodge, right? Because if he if he comes even if he even comes into China, right, that's one step too close, right, to threatening Kim Jong Un's position. Right, Kim Jong Nam is the eldest son, and therefore again, in this kind of charismatic succession and the and the dynastic succession that Koreans are very accustomed to, especially North Koreans who've never lived in democratic South Korea, right, that's a very real kind of, you know, so if, if Kim Jong Nam came around and started pull, shifting his weight around, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect to see him last very long. Yeah. So I mean these are these are real things to think about. Yeah. Back. It seems like you're talking about two different types of reform. 
on the one hand, you're talking about it's a more like political reform, and it's not very involved in revolution or how they're of spring. But on the other hand, you have the China Vietnam, which only economically liberalized, but they're really not any more democratic today as they were decades ago. And some people say the Chinese have been more aggressive now than was the 80s. Um, so there, you have a political reform and economic reform separately. So I'm assuming something has to change eventually in North Korea. Um, which of these two do you see as being more likely to take place? Okay. So with the initial contrast that I made between Eastern Europe and you know Arab Spring and then you know Socialist Asia on the other hand, the reason I made that contrast is to say that that the China and North uh, North Korea and Vietnam are not like the Eastern European cases here. Right? It's not the economic. They're not. Their claim to legitimate rule is not based on economic prosperity. Right. So. What, what you see, what you saw happen in, in Vietnam and China is what's more likely to happen in North Korea if, if the strategic, you know, kind of alignment changed, if they felt like the, the ex, existential threat from South Korea was reduced, then I think what, what I would expect to see is something similar to what happened in Vietnam and China, where they said, we can change the basis of legitimate rule now, right, because there's no more existential threat. So we're just going to open up the economic sphere. We're going to hold on tight to that political sphere, there's not going to be any liberal democracy, right? We're going to hold on tight to that political sphere, but we're going to let the economic sphere kind of circulate freely within that, within those bounds, right? And I think that the incident that, that you have to look at in China is Tiananmen Square, right? Tiananmen Square was the, was the a very clear delineation between economic liberalization and political liberalization where the state said, Within the economic sphere, have at it. You know, you can do whatever you want. Right? I mean, in that sense, I think for those of us who spent time in China, feel like it's recognized that it's more neoliberal and capitalist than the United States or any other, you know, capitalist country. Right? In that, within that economic sphere. But if you push the the envelope and you try to encroach into that political sphere and try to encourage reform in that political sphere. The buck stops there, and the state will will exercise a heavy hand, you know. And so I, I think that's and the similar. I mean, in, in Vietnam too, there's uh, the state is still exercising immense control within the political sphere, right? and even within the economic sphere to some degree. So, but that's what I would expect to see happen in North Korea if if that existential threat, if the threat level, if the perceived level of threat from South Korea ever declined to, uh, you know, yeah. Sir, just one follow-up question after that. Uh, you, that. you were talking about um, North Korea never bureaucratized, and that you have a competing, major competing factions in the bureaucracy. And I can see how that would be very important for political liberalization. But I mean, would that really be necessary for this economic liberalization? So again, I'm taking these uh, ideal types from Weber, who talks about the legitimate forms of rule, Charismatic leadership, bureaucracy, and kind of patriarchy, a patri patrimonial rule, like say a, like a, a, a dynasty or, or a king or something like that. And even within these systems, right, even within the charismatic leadership of Kim Il Sung, there was a great deal of bureaucratization. Right? The, I mean, and, and North Korea today has become extremely bureaucratized. But at least under Kim Il Sung and to Kim Jong Il, right, that was it was second to the, the charismatic leadership. Right, it, it didn't have there was not a distinction. I think that the, that the hallmark of bureaucratization is a distinction between the office and the person holding the office, right? And that's not the case yet in North Korea, right? I mean the. We just handed the country to a 27-year-old son or grandson, right? So, so bureaucratization has taken place in North Korea. Don't get me wrong, right? And there is even factionalism, you know. I think what I'm what I'm trying to say at the, at the end of this here with these market forces and the systemic dissonance and this factionalism is that these other. These other factors here, the, the factionalism and this stuff, um, this stuff is already happening, right? So I think that I think that the only major 
kind of variable left between North Korea and reform is this existential threat from South Korea. I mean, you already see the evidence of like plural kind of infighting within North Korea. You already see the evidence of marketization and market forces, right? The reason why we're not breaking through to full-on economic reform like China and Vietnam is it's the threat. Yeah. So when I talk about, let me go back to this legitimate framework, right? This legitimacy. So this is kind of what you're alluding to, right? I didn't, I didn't mention the historical factor. Well, I mean, I didn't list it here. The historical factor of North Koreans being accustomed to dynamic, to dynastic rule, and to you know being, um, uh, I mean, charismatic leadership being viewed as a legitimate form of rule, right? But also from the historical experience, it's not hard for North Korea to make a case, you know, that more important than the economy is defending ourselves from would-be invaders, those who would, uh, would challenge our, our sovereignty, would challenge our security, and also that, you know, it's been this capitalism and this Cold War stuff that, is, that has divided our country that really should be one country, right? And so this psychology that you're talking about, right, it's, it's, it's the same, right? I mean, this, this argument for legitimate, legitimacy is, uh, this is different than propaganda, right? Legitimacy is kind of, it's a contested um, psychological social framework, right? It's, it's, it's something that the government tries to convince the people of constantly or remind the people of constantly. So if you look at publications from North Korea, I was surprised to see, you do see some, you know, images from the Korean War, but, but you see more images from the Japanese occupation. Right? I mean, like if you, if you pick up any, any uh, of these oversized uh, magazines, very colorful magazines that you can get in Pyongyang, and, and the six, page number six in every month's edition is very graphic uh, photos of you know, Japanese um, beheading or disemboweling I mean, these are, you know, this is, this is like very fresh in the minds of North Koreans and the government does not waste any opportunity to remind the North Koreans that this is the basis, this is why they are still important to the people, right? That's on the government side, right? But like you said, this psychology, it's not just government propaganda, right? The people also, if the people didn't believe that, that wouldn't be a very convincing argument, right? So the, there are enough people in North Korea that that are that say yes, this is this is a valid basis for rule, right? And so until until something changes, until that psychology changes, that you know that that time has passed, and you know now it's time for a government that's ruling on some other grounds. Until that psychology changes, uh, this you know I still think this that North Korea is kind of this is still the basis of their legitimacy, and that's that both the people and the government are, you know, playing into or buying into. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Um, so going off of that, do you think that there's any point at which it, the economic situation gets so bad that it overrules that propaganda and that belief? I mean, things have gotten pretty bad in the past. Yeah. So do you think there's any point at which the, the people will say, you know what, yes, this is important, yes, the safety is important, but you need to make more effort as far as that comes? I think, um, I mean, looking at, the, looking at the historical experience in China and Vietnam, and I'm, I'm going to talk about, yeah, 
See, market transition, so there was a, in 1979, you get the opening and reform, reform and opening in China. In 1986, you get the Wenwei in Vietnam. Right? And then, about five to ten years later, in both countries, maybe more closer to ten years later, in both countries, you have a second wave of reforms right, in both countries. Right? This is documented pretty well in the, in the transition, the transition socialist market transition literature. It's not that things got so bad, it's that things got so good. But when when you get enough market activity going on, when you get you know when you get those uh, kind of low level government officials who you know have their car running running trade routes you know between provinces and you get those women out on the street who've got a few more things from China and they're selling that and they just feel and these kind of these market pressures, the the demand, the institutional pressures to create stable infrastructure for, for exchange and trade and market activity, that's what, that's what um, the Chinese Communist Party would, did not expect would happen, was that these pressures were pushing for reform, for positive reform from the inside out. Right? And I think, I think it's, not going to, it's not likely to be famine in North Korea, it's likely to be People seeing an opportunity and realizing that between me and this opportunity is some institutional barrier, mm -hmm. and I would really like to see that institutional barrier knocked down, right, or replaced with some some more constructive infrastructure, right. And I think that's what's really. Whenever I went out on R and R, when I was in North Korea as a food aid, as a food monitor, every every two months I'd go out on R and R for for a week, and the. Uh, and the, my counterparts there, we were we're very close. They were we're good friends. Uh, had a laundry list of stuff they wanted me to buy for them in China. You know, uh, computer monitor because their kid was getting sick of their old computer monitor. You know, uh, their, his kid likes to play video games at home on their home computer. Right? This is in Pyongyang. Right? So we've got computers in home. We've got we're playing video games. And a lot of pirated software floating around and. Uh, they wanted a Korean English dictionary. Um, some a guy wanted a frisbee. <laughs> he was a little bit weird. But he, these are the pressures. These are the pressures when the government officials themselves are engaging in. You know, and the other thing is when we would travel from the, the countryside. You know, we're up on we're up in Shenzhen, and then we travel around the countryside and we pick up whatever. We pick up you know a load of banana, bananas. Or we pick up a load of Something or other, and especially when we're in Shenzhen, because we're right across the border from uh, from China, right? So you could you could get access to stuff in Shenzhen that you couldn't get in Pyongyang, and you could bet every trip that we took from Shenzhen to, to Pyongyang, into Pyongyang where their families were living, right? the back of the car was always filled up with who knows what. Like it was just in black bags, and we never asked. Like I mean, it could be clothes, it could be fruit, it could be. You know, whiskey it could be whatever, right? But they're, but they're, that's that's small scale enterprise right there. They're shipping goods right across boundaries. I mean, the, you can't normally get across those boundaries, right? And they have kind of a free pass because they're going with us, right? But and they're going to take every advantage of that to, to move goods and, and and to engage in you know kind of small scale uh, economic activity. And so I think those, in my mind, those are the biggest. Uh, forces, those are the forces that are most likely to kind of force the demand change, both at the top and the bottom. You know, and I think it's not surprising that that these are precisely the things that the party tries to keep their pulse on. Right? We saw the uh, we saw the, the the attempt to to uh, a currency reform, right? Which was a which was a very thinly guised attempt to kind of to. You'd have to exchange, say, like 100 yuan, old 100 yuan, like for a new one, right? You have to exchange all your old money for new money, right? But then the exchange rate was like really bad, and then there was also a cap on how much you could exchange, right? So if you've been kind of accumulating capital, right, for the last few years, and now you have to exchange all of it, but you can only exchange about, you know, a fraction of what you earned, right? That's, I mean, so that was that was a really thinly guys attempt to to kind of Cut down on some of that, right? And and what happened to that currency reform? It failed. They rolled it back, and the guy who the guy who supposedly um, called for that reform was executed. So, 
I mean, that, to me, that's evidence of economic, you know, kind of, of market forces forcing, forcing positive change. So we're, you know, how long? I mean, where is it going? You know, how 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 is this going to play out? You know, what falls, what collapses first? Uh, I don't know, but there's a lot of change going on in North Korea right now. It'll be interesting to see where that goes in the next couple of years. Thank you for coming out tonight.